Hey Trisolaris, Roasted, Death's End, Blew My Mind. I'm Michael Everts and you're watching Fit to be Red. And here we go. Death's End is epic, brilliant, trippy, fantastic, beautiful, dark, ingenious, captivating, surprising, suspenseful. This will be spoiler free until we get to my official five likes and five dislikes discussion. If you read the book, if you love the book, please stick around for that. Death's End is the third and concluding novel of Shikshin Lu's Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. This began with The Three Body Problem and The Dark Forest. The Dark Forest is one of the greatest science fiction books ever written, and so is Death's End. Dark Forest is the best of the series, Death's End is the most epic, and it's fit to be read. I'll never look at the universe or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence the same way ever again because of the Dark Forest. Death's End picks up right where the Dark Forest left off. In Death's End, we get Lu's strongest attempts yet at developed characters, starting with scientist Cheng Jin. She's the main character throughout. At the end of Dark Forest, the Earth avoided annihilation due to Luo Ji threatening mutually assured destruction, and this now carries an official title, Sword Holder. Meanwhile, Cheng enters hibernation for hundreds of years. Upon awakening, she's confronted with a choice of whether to be considered for the next sword holder or not, and all of the risks and the consequences that come with that. The conflict with the Trisolarans is not over yet, and the balance of power in that conflict certainly flips or changes more than once and in surprising and thrilling ways. Throughout the book, where things get trippy is our departure from three-dimensional space. We enter four-dimensional space as well as two-dimensional space, the description of both is complex, it's confusing, magical, mind-blowing, mind-numbing. This book has astrophysics, suspense, artificial intelligence, space cities, terraforming, time dilation, pocket dimensions, multiple universes, and even a doomsday button. There are ideas in this book that will take your breath away. Will the Trisolarans annihilate the Earth? Will the Sun, Earth, solar system even survive? Will humans continue to exist in the known universe? What does four-dimensional space look like? What does two-dimensional space look like? Should the sword holder act? Can the laws of physics be manipulated? Can the laws of mathematics be changed? Is there an answer to dark force deterrence? I cannot answer or even discuss these without spoiling the story. So on to the spoiling. Here are my five likes and my five dislikes. Like number one is the character of Wade. His weird delight in the discomfort or even the suffering of others and despair, it eventually becomes one note, but it's a really interesting character for the story, so I can live with that. Like number two is Blue Steel capturing gravity and voting to send the gravitational wave broadcast. Hey, Trisolaris, roasted. This was pretty cool. Like number three, the device of using the fairy tale to dispense intelligence, uh, the foresight of Tian Ming to prep for it uh, for a long time. This was a really creative device in the story and really showed a lot of versatility on Shixin Lu's part. Like number four, I like the author's restraint in the development of technological advancements throughout the series. All of the stuff in the middle that was really like a mind-blowing advance it still had to be subdued so that we could go further later on with tech advancements. Um, Shang Xin uh, sees uh, ships, you know, 60 years after hibernating, and those ships are even more advanced than the ones we saw before. So that was sort of neat. Like number five, uh, the descriptions of four-dimensional space and two-dimensional space. The idea and the attempts to execute it, even if the collapse of three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space was hard to swallow, the discussion of four-dimensional space is some of the most brilliant and difficult science fiction I've ever read or apparently spoken about. An honorable mention would be acknowledging Sofan, the robot ambassador. We didn't just get this character. It took parts of three books to get here. She's the conduit for Sophonic communication with the Trisolarans. She lives on a giant tree by the edge of the city. Too cool. Dislike number one. Sofan is too elegant and she's disarming. It makes sense for the Trisolarans, but it seems more believable the Earth would want 
Sophon to appear more trisolarin or at least less innocent or benign. Dislike number two, it's a like and a dislike, or perhaps a like masquerading as a dislike. Lou is describing observing the three-dimensional world from four-dimensional space, and he uses the ruse of explaining how Guan and Morovich had to learn to deal with this novel visual phenomenon. Shikshin keeps adding examples, but it just gets a little obvious that he's talking directly to us, the reader. This was after he prefaced all of this with, It was the only thing encountered by humanity thus far that absolutely could not be captured by language, which he then goes on to capture for us using language. Dislike number three, Tian Ming's fairy tale. I just don't believe the Trisolarans wouldn't have caught on to what he's doing. Lu tries really hard to sell it, and his versatility is on full display, but in hindsight, they had to see what was going on. Dislike number four, taking the three kids away in the shuttle, that point where Shang was uh, with AA and they were leaving to escape after the false alarm and they see the kids there, it just kind of reeks of like watching a movie and they had to have some kids in there or something like that. So that was not really believable for me. Dislike number five, Character development was not an issue in the first two books, other than that it was neglected. Lou ventures into making up for it by spending a little bit more time on a few characters, but mostly this just results in two-dimensional or flat characters with a few distinct personality traits. Chang is the one example in that she's a big focus, but she's not developed or broad. It is interesting that Chang's morality seems to be more often than not incompatible with the reality of the world and the greater universe, I think that would make a really interesting topic for a book club to discuss. Wade, uh, he is interesting for that one thing that I mentioned earlier, but only that one thing. Worst Fail is really an insignificant character that's brought in just near the end. There's this scientist with autism. The idea is that he connects to light speed and relates it to his own autism, uh, those struggles that he has. It's hokey at best, and it's a clear attempt to make an interesting personality quirk. It ends up being just that, a personality quirk. And this next one I'm not going to call a dislike so much as maybe a missed opportunity, but a lot of items that fell outside of immediate sci-fi are at times weak. We hear, the president, a beautiful woman who looked very young. Why is that the description of her? Or the politics are sometimes rushed. Parliament have passed a new resolution repealing escapism. Sure, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but everything else is so disgust and vetted, this just felt a little rushed. Especially because we talked about escapism earlier in the books, and it was actually given a lot of page time. So to just dismiss it very quickly here, it felt very rushed. With a book this epic and filled with new ideas, I feel as if I could go on talking about it for hours. This book is epic, and I 100% recommend it to anyone who appreciates elevated and excellent science fiction. This is one of those series where I think we'll be measuring other series and novels against it for decades to come. Thank you for watching today. I post new content every week, so please like and subscribe. Please click the notification bell. That way we can do this again. Please leave your thoughts in the comments. There's so much more to unpack with this series, so let's dive in.